So for our next session, we are addressing public service broadcasting prominence in a multi-platform environment. Who is curating the con content and what are the solutions being taken by public service broadcasters in the UK and Europe to ensure public service content is accessible to audience? Our moderator has over 14 years of experience in broadcast media compliance, governance and regulation in the UK and Ireland. And he has a keen interest in developing policy areas around AVM's transposition um, public service media audience engagement, public service media prominence, and children's programming. Please welcome Liam Boyle. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we will take questions from the floor after this, but also you can contribute on Slido. Oh. Hi, Kevin. Uh, so I have uh, Kate Biggs here today from, from Ofcom, and I have uh, Wouter Akira from EBU, and we're going to talk to you today about public service media really, I suppose, we, we still call it public service broadcasting, but it's public service media prominence. And we're, we're gonna look at it from regulators' perspective. Um, I myself work for BAI, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, so we're heavily involved in, I suppose, looking at what's, what's happening in the arena from a regulator's point of view, and Kate works at Ofcom in the UK, would also be looking at that point of view. But we also want to obviously see what broadcasters can do in this field. Um, so I think uh, Wouter's going to go through, uh, I suppose, the range of different, um, uh, the range of different t tactics, if you want to put it that way, or the range of different perspectives that broadcasters can take in this slow-moving but also kind of fast-moving uh, uh, arena. So, um, I'm sure, Kate, do, do you want to go first and yes. go through some of your Thank interesting you. slides with I'm us? I'm going to head to the platform if that's Thank all right. Thank you very much. Now, making regulation interesting I think is a tough gig let alone the last session after a long fascinating conference just before lunch so I'll try and be relatively brief uh, you'll be pleased to hear so yes as Liam introduced I'm from Ofcom which is the UK's independent communications regulator um, we've heard a lot I think on this conference about how you make public service broadcasting still relevant and compelling to the widest possible audience. But it's not enough just to make that great content. It has to be easy to find. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about a bit today. So, as we all know, and has been talked about ad nauseum, audiences are moving away from just traditional broadcast services to a whole range of online services. Your choice of what to watch, on what device, and when has exploded. And that has to be a great thing. And yes, I'd agree. It's a brilliant thing for most audiences most of the time in terms of consumer choice, but also creative and technical innovation. Also, market growth. But there are also risks. A more competitive and global marketplace creates direct challenges to regional and even national broadcasters and their wider domestic creative economies. And for audiences, it can impact upon their awareness of and their ease of access to public service media. Currently, regulation in the UK protects both the wide availability and prominence of public service TV channels, but this regulation was largely designed over 20 years ago. In a world of analog TV long before the first iPhone or smart TV, let alone before they became popular products in the majority of UK households. Now, I'm not negating the importance of that regulation. It remains really important. TV channels are still widely viewed in the UK. Um, and the TV platforms, your traditional platforms, terrestrial cable and satellite, remain a really key route to content for most people. But we also can't ignore the growing number of people with limited or no relationship with scheduled TV services or broadcast services. And currently, regulation doesn't extend to the streamed or on-demand services of our public service broadcasters, 
nor does it apply to the growing range of content navigation and access services, whether that's a smart TV like Samsung or um, Sky Glass, whether that's a streaming stick like Roku or Amazon Fire or via a games console. It is limited and it's becoming more limited. So in 2018, Ofcom set out some recommendations. Uh, well, sorry, we started by consulting industry. Do new rules and regulations, are they needed? We concluded that the commercial dynamics were such that UK audiences might increasingly find the PSB's content harder to find. They might become less aware of what's available to them and less likely to watch it. We also recognise that this risk was perhaps most acute for the smaller PSBs, with limited capability to pay for prominence or to gain access to global platforms on reasonable or sustainable terms. So, what's the solution? We recommended that government new int introduce new legislation that would extend the scope of prominence and availability regulation to the PSB's on-demand and stream services, and to extend the platforms in scope to all interfaces that are used by a significant number of people as their main way of accessing TV. Apologies for the slightly wordy <laughs> explanation, but we're very mindful about creating new regulation that is as future-proof as possible. This isn't about us regulating devices, it's about regulating the service you provide. In effect, what we were suggesting is that you bring connected TVs, service providers into scope. Now, as I mentioned, in terms of future proofing, we think the regulator needs a degree of regulatory judgment and flexibility to make the new regime workable and reasonably future proof. So we suggested that the policy objectives are made clear and established in statute, and that these might include ensuring that PSM, public service media, is widely available, making sure that it's given appropriate prominence on all regulated TV platforms, and that it's made available on terms that are consistent with both the sustainable delivery of public service media, but also don't place disproportionate restrictions on TV platform innovation and consumer choice. And then underpinning that, there would be a regulatory role. So Ofcom would have a role in issuing guidance, setting clear expectations around what we consider appropriate prominence and reasonable terms to be. We would have new enforcement powers, so the ability to gather evidence for monitoring compliance, assessing breaches, and remedial action where necessary. But we'd also have a dispute resolution function, so we could resolve matters where PSM providers and platforms couldn't agree terms. Where are we now and what next? You might have picked up, it's been three years since we made those recommendations, but we're finally on the brink of change. So government published a white paper at the end of April, setting out their ambition to, in effect, enact our recommendations and to introduce a new bill early in this parliamentary session, so in the coming months. We're continuing to work with government on the detail, and in doing so, are very keen to work with other jurisdictions um, and regulators around their implementation of similar measures. There's similar trends across Europe, clearly. But crucially, we're also continuing to work closely with industry. And by industry, I mean not just the broadcasters, but also the platforms and manufacturers to make sure their expertise and concerns positively influence the new regime's design. We're clear that the best outcomes will be delivered by industry reaching commercial arrangements wherever possible without regulatory intervention. However, we also want to make sure we've got the right tools and can act as an effective back backstop where needed. Our focus will always remain on audience interests. And we believe we're well placed to make decisions that objectively and independently consider both the sustainability of public service broadcasting or media with that of consumer choice, market innovation and growth. So that was just a kind of hopeful whistle-stop tour of what the problem is, what we in the UK consider the best solution might be, and what happens next. So looking forward to this conversation continuing. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, really interesting overview of how things have 
moved in the UK over the past few years, and I suppose the key things that keep coming over is the range of tech involved and the range of stakeholders, the, the, the level of fragmentation that I think we're all aware of, uh, but that, that the core consideration is always audience access first. So I think we'll expand on that a bit more during our Q&A session. Uh, but thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, up next, we have Reuter, um, who will give us a more, I suppose, European perspective on the issue. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me. It's, it was a great pleasure yesterday also to attend the gala dinner because it really showed that I don't have to explain anymore why prominence is so important, why it is important that services provided by these editors, journalists yesterday, uh, needs to be well known and easy to find, e easy to notice uh, to the wider uh, public. My name is Wouter, Wouter Gekire. I'm leading all the regulatory campaigns in Brussels on behalf of our members, public service broadcasters, many of which are of course also part of uh, the Circum family, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share some insights on an important discussion. And the discussion is really, um, or the the question of the day is, why is it on the Brussels radar? Why is it on the uh, radar of many regulators and legislators across Europe? Um, to start with, my colleagues every year publish a fantastic um, report, and actually an update of this report has been published this week. So apologies if I didn't include the last figure. But it really shows the global and diverse nature in which public media is currently functioning. Uh, I could have picked many slides to kind of indicate where we are as public media, but also what the environment is. But needless to say that many of the tech companies that were mentioned are actually in a different financial um, uh, game here. I mean, uh, and why are we looking at these players? Because they're clearly not media companies. Um, we could have also singled out European media companies. We could have singled out telecom companies, which also uh, invest heavily in, in media and, and exciting uh, media solutions. But these are companies that are tech giants, so meaning the audiovisual part of their activity is not necessarily at the core of their activities. But yet they have a lot of financial leeway to invest in exciting new services, and they take on a chunk of their services or take it as part of their mission to also invest in audiovisual markets, the Amazons, the Apples, uh, the Facebooks. Uh, Facebook being a social media uh, network, but um, media activities do surface more and more there also. So it is important to talk to them because prominence is really um, at the core uh, of the attention there. How do we ensure relevant public media being available but also findable on services offered by these uh, tech uh, giants? It is also an issue, of course, of behavior, young people particularly, uh, we see various ways in which they engage in accessing media and video. Um, not all of the um, platforms are highlighted here, but it shows you the fragmentation, the diversification that is, is currently going on. Third, also the interfaces and the way in which audiences more broad, broad, uh, generally kind of engage uh, with content. I should say prominence of public media or more general uh, content of general interest is one of the, the top questions I get from the membership when they reach out to Brussels and also to the legal colleagues, is how do I kind of go about it? How do I make my case for more prominence uh, with my local regulator? I mean, this kind of screenshot is, is a nice uh, conversation starter in a way, because it really summarizes very well that ballpark I was explaining um, at the very start. Here you have a screen from a German uh, IPTV provider which dates back from a few years ago or two years ago, just before the whole discussion on the German regime on prominence was actually launched. We see um, a range of apps there, um, one of which is couch play games. So showing you very well that it's not just about media, it's also about a lot of other types of applications that will figure next to the core media services that the likes of us are providing. You also have a lot of apps, applications being pushed by the IPTV or device manufacturer itself. In this case, cloud services and music services, Magenta Cloud and Mag Mag uh, Magenta uh, Music. And you have your public broadcasters trying to also fit in. We have in the German context, ARD on page number one and ZDF on the last page. That was the situation two or three years ago. So it shows you very well what the the kind of challenges. You have a range of different services 
some also offered directly by the ones actually operating these systems, and you have also the media um, apps that need to figure there. This is clearly an option of an alphabetical order with all the advantages and disadvantages because ZDF, poor colleagues, they haven't changed their name yet, they're still called ZDF, but they were just unlucky with their name. Um, so these, it's not a random decision, but the corporate decision to kind of go for an alphabetical um, order has impact on the way you find, notice, pick up uh, content. Um, the German system was all about kind of coming up with regimes that could cure that a bit, that could maybe guide some of those operators in slightly uh, adapting uh, their regimes. So there is a whole law being adopted in Germany, which focuses very much on user interfaces uh, with a focus on media. And this would be one of those devices, interfaces that would really tick that box. And there's specific language for linear, for instance, on how it should appear on the first page, but also for the on-demand uh, catch-up service. Uh, can it be easy to find for the public? And of course, those concepts can be verb. Uh, connected TV is a very important case, and we have a lot of members coming to us with, with examples uh, because it's a very relevant one. But what would work for a device like that or interface like that would not necessarily work for another type of platform. I'll come back uh, to that in a minute. What we did in Brussels back in the days, I mean, the, the, the story of prominence, of course, uh, didn't start yesterday, but uh, seven or eight years ago when in the lead-up to the uh, last revision of a directive, which is a law in EU speech, speech, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive um, underwent a last review in 2018. We advocated quite actively for wording on prominence of audiovisual media services of general interest, again, EU speech for public value content. In the broadest sense, it could also be commercial content, but broadly content and services and channels that serve a certain general interest uh, that contributes uh, to society. You see the wording adopted is, is may, so it's an option. Uh, it isn't compulsory, and that's why we see now some regulators acting, because there's a need, but in other countries it's not uh, yet the case. National implementation, so we're now facing a directive that needed to be implemented in 2020. Two years later, there's still a lot of people, that are, a lot of regulators and legislators that need to implement this directive. Not necessarily the rules on prominence, because as you saw, they're optional. But on prominence, there's useful new legal provisions um, appearing across Europe. Germany, I just referred to, is a prime example because it lays down in the law already quite detailed provisions on how prominence would look on certain devices. We have a French approach also emerging with legal provisions and the regulator there also now looking into how would it look like in terms of specific measures, um, uh, prominence. And we have also a number of other countries where we have basic legal provisions which allow regulators to intervene, but not that is not necessarily the case. So that's why I'm looking at Liam and also other regulators across Europe, because there's still important tasks, important decisions to be made around prominence. First of all, have a basic legal framework, but also trying to make sense of all these use cases, all these devices that you're currently holding, uh, devices and operating systems and the likes, and how would prominence actually be broken down there. So there is a proposal also in Ireland in uh, the pipeline, so we should be seeing that very soon. My last two minutes, I just want to kind of express a call to all of you in case you haven't yet understood how important this issue is, but also if you hadn't had talks yet with partner organizations or regulators locally, to look at implementation of, of measures of this kind. First of all, rest assured, it is a broad notion of services and channels that could actually benefit from regimes. So if you have commercial counterparts that also have that value for society, they could also be applicable, um, uh, apply for uh, these kind of measures. To who can it apply? I showed an example which is more, more or less a TV environment, a connected TV environment, but it could also stretch into user interfaces appearing elsewhere, on app stores, social um, networks. The German example is again a nice one, because they adopted not exactly the same measures for connected TVs, as opposed to other type of intermediaries, platforms more generally, which at this stage are perhaps not yet core for media, but which nonetheless play an important um, role. Which leads me to my third point, measures. 
there's a range of measures you could be asking or advocating for. When you have a screen like a connected TV, that's actually quite handy to start a conversation. You can explain how it looks for the audience and then try to work out what is it I'm after. Do I want to appear on the first page? Is it about ranking? Is it about my broadcast channels, which are the traditional ones? Is it about my catch-up offer? How do I want to see that appear? Um, have I worked out what are the core platforms I want to eye? What is important for my organization um, uh, and what will be important also in the coming years? So there, I think, there's an important role for the regulators, and I'm glad Kate already shared some insights. But across Europe, I think it's important that the regulators have a process in place. There will be different solutions needed in different countries, but I think it's very important that you, together with your partners uh, that you work with, uh, are having those conversations, because uh, they're crucial. They're really about uh, the value you're producing, the value you're, you're, uh, you're creating, and, and just to ensure that the audience can actually benefit. I'd just like to keep it at that with 20 seconds on the clock. Thank you. Thanks very much, Roger, for that really good whistle-stop tour across Europe to give us a, a really good idea of, uh, I suppose, the genesis of the, the legislation. And as Kate said, it can be quite difficult sometimes to, to make regulation sound sexy or at least interested for many of us. But I think we, we can see the impact of where legislation lies, how the regulators interpret it, and how they apply it to different broadcasters. I suppose, flowing on from your, your last point, Roger, what kind of practical solutions could broadcasters bring to the discussion here? What, what kind of, if there is lobbying to be had uh, to, to legislators or regulators, what, what kind of practical solutions can they, can they bring to the table? Well, the EBU has been trying to bring and is bringing together communities of members that really have experience with those use cases. I mean, uh, we're constantly kind of bringing those people together because uh, TG Kangar was actually an excellent example. Back in the days, a few years ago, Alan came to us to say, can you actually help us with bring those contacts in also from the membership? Because we're, not, we're starting to, to kind of build a camp campaign in favor of uh, prominence, including TG Har's, uh, Kahar's uh, services also in it. Uh, and that worked very well, and we're hopeful also in Ireland that there would be a solution or a basis for a solution there. So, that is quite important from where I stand, that that conversation we have around specific use cases. What is important for you in a given market? What do you see as an important interface? Where are young people currently? Where are older people currently? Uh, and break it down in very simple scenarios. Because prominence is one of these much touted words, and it, it, everyone agrees it's important. But once you break it down in details, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's complicated. There's no, no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. So I would say break it down into very concrete cases and go and show it first to anyone interested, partners, and then go and talk to the regulators is, is my... Uh, because in Brussels we do what we can, but it's clear for these kind of issues, the answer is not just European, because often lobbyists in Brussels say, yeah, it's a global problem, so we need a European solution. Yes. For many, we need a base layer often that is, is European. And when we talk about online platforms and the way they behave, there's actually strong rules from Europe coming. They've just been adopted. But for prominence, it's so much tied to your national broadcasters, your national systems, the way we work. So it is very important that bottom-up campaigning is, 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 is starting. Absolutely, no, and I think, um I, I would mirror that from, from an Irish perspective, that we, we rely on the broadcasters really to, to be ahead of the game in terms of trying to future-proof legislation. And I, I think everyone would agree that anyone who had legislation in the early 2000s, the internet wasn't really dealt with in any particular way. So it was, it was out of date the second it was drafted. So I think if there's an opportunity in any, of, uh, in any other jurisdiction where, where legislation or codes and rules are being developed, I think that we really heavily rely on the broadcasters to mm. spot those things first. Uh, and we've seen that firsthand in terms of really technical aspects of legislation, but you know, things around definitions of user interfaces and I heard Kate speak of Sky Glass, which is kind of a, a new idea of, of connecting with audiences as well. So I think there's a message from today is that 
the regulators definitely rely on the broadcasters as well to, to, to share their expertise. Uh, Kate, in terms of, I suppose, y you spoke about kind of facilitating the framework really, and again, I, I think from an Irish experience, we would always look to the UK as well of having a similar approach to regulation that long-standing commercial arrangements between broadcasters and platform providers give us a good basis going forward. But it's not always the case, obviously, with the video on demand providers and the SVODs who don't have that long-standing kind of relationship with broadcasters. What do you think is key now in developing that new relationship and, and what kind of tools would Ofcom like in order to, to kind of, I suppose, respond to conflict resolution if it does come to pass? So a kind of couple of points, I suppose, to clarify. We're very much focused at least in this work, around the prominence of the service providers, not the prominence within a service. So you come across BBC content within Netflix, for example, yeah. you know, with the BBC blocks. That's not what we're talking about yeah. here. This is about turning on your smart TV and you can readily find all four, ITV Hub, BBC, STV, S4C. That's what I'm talking around here. Now, fair, there are kind of long established commercial relationships, particularly with the more traditional TV platforms, but that's not strictly true with some of the newer, more sort of West Coast, your kind of Roku, as an example, Chromecast. Well, hang on, the UK is a tiny little island in a bit. Why do we need to negotiate something special? that looks different. We want to sell to multiple markets. We don't want to create a bespoke model. And you've also got a, an imbalance, I guess, in the power of negotiation between smaller domestic broadcasters and global platforms. So I think our focus is around, OK, well, how do you redress that balance without being too heavy-handed? Yep. Totally agree with your point around there are national peculiarities that you want to respect. And also, there's innovation that might be good for consumer. Mm -hmm. That there are different platforms. Some might be app-based, some more program-based, some might put an emphasis on streamed or kind of fast channels over on demand. Kind of, you want to encourage all that diversity. So the regulation needs to find a way to kind of support that and help redress some of the imbalance in reaching the best outcomes. Because I think there is a sweet spot yeah. that is commercially attractive for the platforms, is beneficial for the public service broadcaster, but most importantly, the audience wins. Yeah. They get the best content easily accessible in whatever way they want. No, it makes sense, and I think we're hearing it more and more that this old kind of idea that, that, that traditional PSBs in particular are, are pit against the SVODs as, as a threat mm. really isn't probably the best way to look at the situation. There's opportunities for everyone here, and the SPODs at the end of the day need that national hook to audiences that they don't necessarily get from their own commission content. So if they can work together, or at least have a framework to work together, the audience wins out at the end of the day. Um, I suppose, Ryder, in terms of other factors that are also feeding into this you know, already fairly complex mm. process, are there other key legislation in particular that might have an impact, I'm thinking Digital Services Act or the Media Freedom Act that might have yeah. kind of a, an extra layer of complexity to the, the issue? What the um, discussions with members on prominence also learn is that a often, or their digital colleagues often feel there's a bit of an unequal bargaining pos position. Uh, and I think what the famous acts, the EU Digital Markets Act particularly, but also the Digital Services Act uh, are trying to do is kind of rebalance a bit the, uh, the equation there, that it's, it's possible for content producers, content distributors that have to deal with large platforms, that they would have that conversation, which is often about ticking boxes of terms and conditions, but which could also be about commercial negotiations, but that there would be more an equal uh, uh, bargaining position there, because uh, that was really a recurring theme also in the lead up to the uh, positioning of the EBU on the EU acts that members feel, felt strongly about. That their, their, their word was not really like, properly uh, held into account and it was very difficult because let's not forget 
most of the contacts we have with the newer big tech platforms are not personalized contracts. They're often a broadcasting company is just like any old user invited to tick boxes, general terms and conditions. So arguing your case that you're actually having a mission as a public broadcaster so would justify you having a specific conversation with a platform to say, well, there's certain issues, and this goes way beyond prominence, of course, are important for us. Uh, and that's why we are hopeful in a few years' time, because the acts will be taking time to be um, applied directly, that it would start shifting a bit the balance. Now, and that might be a good basis actually to start also conversations on prominence, but that is not directly addressed in these EU acts. Uh, but I think that more equal uh, grounds um, is, is important. What I should also say, this is not an issue of scaremongering and, and they'll take us over, because I, I think in many cases, indeed, platforms are coming to Europe into specific markets because some of the public media services and apps, people like them and really want them. We're also trying to cater here for countries where public media might be struggling, struggling perhaps a bit and would have additional safeguards to have that conversation with platforms to ensure they have their place there. Not in terms of access, but also in terms of recognition. Um, to have spaces there where the, the comedian there said, look, space to fail. I mean, if public media is asked to kind of create those spaces, they will also would want the kind of space then by third parties to actually be facilitating that. So there's, you start by addressing prominence and you end up with discussing the whole sector and its, its survival and also its, its future. That's exciting. You do, I think, yeah. It, it does often kind of springboard onto that quite Absolutely. wider sustainability issue. And I, I, I think one thing to point out as well from today, and I've seen it come up in these discussions as well, is that this is also different from EU works as we call it prominence, which is a difficult article under the AVMS, uh, but which I think some broadcasters sometimes see as this, this easy solution to this wider threat of SVODs, that mm -hmm. if we set a high quota, uh, or, and if we link it to, say, the content levy as well, we can, we can kind of milk the cow and get, reap the benefits separately, but they're not tied up. They're, there's no, they're separate things and separate instruments that will have separate kind of uh, regulation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, I, I'm always interested, <laughs> not that we steal all of Ofcom's ideas, but we look very much <laughs> over the Irish Sea in, in terms of how you engage with the industry in particular. Uh, and you're obviously at the kind of the latter stages of having done the consultation uh, process. What were the key things that came out for that for you? What were the, the questions that you posed and what were you really looking for from broadcasters? bring to the table? From the broadcasters, it was really a really clear, evidenced description of what the problem was. So the growing importance of video on demand for their reach, for their impact, the, um, the growing difficulties in reaching commercial arrangements. So the number of services that were launched and that simply didn't have all the UK's PSBs available. Mm. So, you know, major brand connected TVs launching before Christmas with no All4, with no My5. Yeah. Uh, to great consumer frustration. And actually what I found really interesting, that was also frustrating for the manufacturers. Yeah. Because they were getting heat as well. So it felt altogether quite unsatisfactory for all parties, particularly for the audiences. Um, so I think what was really helpful was having that conversation, not just with the broadcasters who were invaluable in pushing this. I mean, they were the ones who really started this conversation in the UK back in sort of 2015, but actually bringing everyone around the table to go, okay, well, what's a workable solution? And that has to be sustainable from a PSB point of view, but also sustainable commercially, right? We want to attract innovation. We want to attract different services. You don't want the UK to not be an attractive place mm -hmm. to do business. So I think that was what was really important about not just the outcomes of the consultation, but the kind of process of getting people around the table uh, and trying to kind of broker what a workable solution might be and what the proportionate role of regulation should be. 
Yeah, absolutely. In a way, we're always looking as the regulator, which I know yeah. you guys do the same. What's the least we can do here yep. to make this function well? Have you seen that differently from a European perspective, Wouter? I mean, obviously, we have the, the wonderful range of uh, interpretation of, of a directive. You know, uh, mm. we, we have, uh, I suppose, such a different history in jurisdictions and how they approach um, uh, compliance and regulation as well. Have we? Have you seen a different approach being taken in, in larger jurisdictions in particular? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think they're valid sometimes, as, as, as we explained. I mean, there's different user interfaces sometimes being important in certain markets. Um, but I mean, there are trends, of course. I mean, I was listening carefully also to some of the other interventions. And um, prominence is, of course, an important issue. But if you kind of go into the issue, there's also very important issues around data mm -hmm. and the way algorithms work. Part of the uncertainty that our members face when they engage with, um, with platforms, and that's some of the problems will be dealt with by the Digital Markets Act, how does the data that I give that platform that relates to the services, footage, productions that I put on the platform, how does it get back to me? Can I actually make sense of it? Can a platform properly explain how an algorithm, a recommendation system works? Um, and there's a lot of conversations, I think, that our members have with platforms. But the gist of it seems to be, trust us, come into our platforms, into our systems, feed it with all the data, and you'll see, naturally, you'll, you'll gain success. And the logic would be, well, prominence will then naturally occur. I mean, it was quite interesting, the, the, the colleague from, from TikTok saying, well, I, I got to know the algorithm. I didn't know how it worked, but it was just by not clicking and liking certain things that suddenly I found myself with a feed which I thought was personalized enough, which is great, I think, but which for public media or media, I think, representatives or people working in the media is, is a bit troublesome. I mean, are we allowing ourselves just that the control of data and control of the way a recommendation, uh, recommendation system works in the hands of corporate policies? I mean, I'm not an activist, but I think as a media professional, it is quite important. Because if I want to be an advocate for prominence, I probably also need some basic visibility, knowledge about how data travels back to the broadcaster or to the journalist or the editor uh, and how a recommendation system works. There's exciting uh, lines of work in our membership, but also with the EBU, with new exciting projects, innovative projects, uh, one called the European Perspective, where we trying to do exactly that also, looking at algorithms and the way our journalists are picking up stories and, and put them on their own platforms. And I think it's probably an important focus for the coming months and, and two or three years to kind of try it also. Work with platforms, absolutely, we need them, but also see how we can adapt our own services, the way they're, they're offered now, and be also continue to be a very good alternative. Because it cannot be that we have to rely on TikTok and the next TikTok and the next one. We need strong digital platforms, applications ourselves. Whatever will happen, I think. Sorry, Tim. No, that's, it's, a, it's a really good point because I think it shows that it shows the timing of all of this and yeah. uh, the, the wonderful world of audiovisual media service directed <laughs> transposition. I can say that in one breath. Uh, it, it, it's forcing all, all of these different jurisdictions to, to bring all their legislation and regulation up to date to deal with non-linear and on-demand, but also to deal with online and online harm, and we're seeing that in the UK as well, that in lots of jurisdictions, the, the, the scope of regulation has been exp expanded out, so the regulators need to know everything in terms of how these players work, uh, how their algorithms work, uh, and that's not just broadcasting, that's outside of that as well. So there's a whole new world of kind of learning, I think, involved here. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, broadcasters and uh, internet providers, if you want to call them that way, are all going to be regulatees as well under the mm -hmm. same umbrella, and that's different jurisdictions. So it's interesting times for everyone involved, I think. Uh, I'm conscious of time and that we could spend talking about this all day, to be fair. Um, <laughs> hot topic for us. I'll just open it, open it up to the floor if we have any questions from anyone. Do you want to raise your hand? Joe?
last three and a half, we've been largely in our heads talking about the small screen, mm -hmm. and we've been sort of we're exhausted trying to come up with new formats and new ways of telling stories and new, get, new ways of getting content out there. And I'm not sure that any of the broadcasters have any uh, energy left to worry, to worry about regulation and prominence and so on. So I think this needs a huge pan-European effort to try and, uh, and, and you know, come, come up with a, a regulation um, model for, for, for Europe that allows smaller regional broadcasters, you know, to, to get the kind of prominence that, 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 that they're being squeezed out of. Like, as, an, as an anecdote, we have two smart TVs at home, and I'm, actually, I'm interested that we're talking about the large screen and all the graphics today spoke about TV, that sit-back experience. But our first smart TV changed the way we watched and, and consumed content at home. The second smart TV came with uh, a remote control that had Netflix and Amazon Prime preloaded on it. And everybody in the house except me went, yay, great. All you got to do is press the button up it comes. And I was thinking, well, there's one more nail in our PBA, you know, public service media coffin because you know, it's making uh, the, these giants more accessible uh, because they've worked out that it, it suits the, the manufacturer of the, of the, of the uh, device and also um, the people who are squeezing, it in, squeezing us in the market. Uh, and that's the uphill battle that we're facing, you know. And um, so I'm a little bit disappointed just that it's back to the broadcasters to have to try and push and, you know, create, you know, sort out the regulatory issue as well, or at least contribute in a way that I'm not sure we have the energy to do. And I, I think from an Irish perspective anyway, I think the broadcasters have already done what they can do in that regard and have really helped frame the actual legislation itself, have fed into the amendments process, have spotted things that need changing, uh, and it, it's worked very well. And I think the, the BAI has re relied on the broadcasters to be able to do that. Um, I hope the onus isn't too hard on the broadcasters, but we need to, to, them to come with us. I, suppose. I heard many years ago, Kate, this idea that we'd be able to have a PSB button on our remote beside the Netflix and uh, Amazon button. Is there still a kind of an appetite for that in the UK? Our view is around equivalence. So if you want to offer Netflix the ability to buy a button, dollar a set, that's great. What's your offer to PSBs? Because our view is appropriate prominence. They're still really important services to UK audiences. So how do we make sure they're just as visible, if not more visible, than some of those also very highly attractive commercial offerings? So it's not a matter of mandating buttons on remote controls, kind of there lies madness. But it's about having, and you're right, that's the conversation for the regulator within the legislative framework to go and have those conversations. I think what we want to understand from broadcasters is what are your current commercial agreements look like? Where are the pinch points? What's really hurting? Is it around things like that? Is it around data? Which I think for a significant number of broadcasters it is. So how do we reach sensible conclusions around that? It's understanding what your day-to-day -day commercial negotiations are as much as we can, um, rather than solve it for us without us being at the party fully. Yeah, and I think I'm supposed to expand on that. Uh, again, from an Irish perspective, we're wary that in order for commercial arrangements to work, there's a, there's a, it's based on good faith and good actors there, and that there's established relationships with the old, more old-fashioned linear providers, shall we say, uh, and that there's a good basis there for, for, for building on that relationship working forward, where that's not so certain is with the SVODs and the, and the VODs. Yeah. Just, oh sorry, just very quickly, I was just going to say, I mean, assuming the legislation is introduced in the UK, we think the regulator's role is to set out some tram lines, right? This is what's acceptable. If you, if you do a deal within those tram lines, brilliant. We'll stay away from it. So that might mean buttons, that might mean, you know, front top left for your app, it might mean a certain amount of the, you know, the tiles and the program profiled is... You know, it could mean all sorts of things, and that is okay, but it's about equivalence and having some transparency around what's being done and offered. Sorry. Thanks, Kate. You know, you're fine. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Liam, Kate, and uh, Wouter. 
Walter. Perfect. Walter, okay, thank you very much um, for this morning's discussion and for participating. We're very grateful.